Good afternoon. Good afternoon and happy Sabbath, everyone. Um, it's, a, it's a privilege and a, um, and a pleasure to be here with you um, to share a um, message to that. Um, I, I really appreciate um, the prayers as well. Um, by God's grace, it's been, it's been a tough, tough time. Um, as you may know, I've, I've, unfortunately, I lost my grandmother um, quite recently. And, um, it just really helps me to appreciate the life you know, and to appreciate every moment that God gives. And you know, hearing all the, the testimonies about her life and the friends that have visited, it's just, it's actually inspired, giving more inspiration to follow in the way that she, she, she had gone. She was a very um, staunch Christian um, and she had a, 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 a really strong faith. Um, and I know that she went and said for me to oh to stop everything, it's still to continue in, in God's work and continue to, to bless others um, by his grace. Um, thank you for the intro, um, Abba. Um, Abba, you can't help but be infused when, when you meet Abba and Abba. Um, I've been that to by God's grace to witness what they do little by little and it's a very inspiration to me um, of what God does with them. And we really have a focus by God's grace in this time. We know, um, especially for this time with City Mission, we know that every day at least a quarter of a million people um, are moving into cities. Um, by, by then, over 95% of the population of the world will be in cities. But we know that there are coming judgments for these cities where whole cities will just be swept away. Amen. But yet, if you look into the cities right now, What's going on? Are people being warned of, of what is to come? So we see um, this is a great work before us in, in what we need to do. But God's divided the way, amen? It's just for us to follow um, by His grace. Follow simple instructions, you know. Um, when the instructions were given to Joshua for Jericho, it could have been something to doubt. Hold on, do you see how big these walls are? But yet God asked him to simply walk around seven times and to blow the one. And that's how God says to us is there's simple instructions, lifestyle centers, um, health food stores, restaurants, as well as teams working door to door. And this will, by God's grace, accomplish um, great and, and accomplish so much in our cities. And that's what we as mental ministry um, especially set to do is put forward what, um, what God has set us out to do in this health work this time of, of great need. So with that, um, I just want to another comment as well. It's, um, it's amazing how many children you have here. It's like, wow, it's actually more than, a, than an adult. <laughs> <laughs> I've never seen that in a, in a proportion. It's amazing. And um, I was really blessed. That was one of my favorite things when you, when you saw me need to cross to Jesus. Um, that was really blessed. I was touched by that. So thank you. Thank you, George, for thinking that. Um, thank you. Um, the title of my, my sermon um, today is it's called Purpose. It's not created as masterpiece, but it's actually um, Purpose. And um, just before I go into the word and share the introduction, I'm just going to have a word of prayer because I need God's help. It's an old Father, we come in the name of Jesus, Lord, um, thanking you for, for the life itself. Thank you that I can see it here, I can walk, I can talk, I can even taste food. All these things, Father, um, you know, can't take for granted. Um, moment by moment we live, and Lord, especially in this moment now, we're asking for you to, to show yourself through me. Um, I am not dust of myself, I can do absolutely nothing, Father, and I just ask that you speak through me to your people at this time. I know that your Holy Spirit will be on ground, but I pray that He gives me the words even now. And that He tailor your message to every individual heart that is here, Lord. That will may um, make a change in life. May see you different. May see this message of help differently by your grace. So thank you, Father, for what you are going to do. He said, um, my word that I should put in thy mouth shall not depart from thy mouth nor from the mouth of thy seed, nor from the mouth of thy seed seed, from henceforth and forever. So we thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. So 
so as I said, the message for today, the message for today is entitled Purpose. He is my help. 
You can span the whole character of God just looking at those four names. But you're seeing that the devil is trying to change their names and therefore to see how we see God's character. Do you follow? So how these how those four children go through their journey shows us more and more of the character of God. And that's what we are called to do by His grace, is to reveal the character of God. It says, let us make man in our image. We fell away from that, unfortunately, in Genesis 3. And ever since we've been in that Bible where we've been looking to restore, God has been looking to restore us back into the original. Not just physically, not just mentally, but spiritually also. This threefold restoration that God is looking to do with us. So knowing that the, the purpose of God is to reveal his character through us, we just need to look at what's going on in the world and ask ourselves the question, can we see God's character being revealed? in what's going on in the world now. Wars, rumors of wars, indiscipline, crime waves, epidemics. The world needs us to step into that purpose which God has given us. They need a revelation of his character. Amen? So with this, we know that we are not alone in doing this because in Isaiah 43 verse 1, God says, Thou art mine. The responsibility of revealing God is something that is too great for us to do on our own. Praise God that we belong to Him. To Him. So therefore, He takes the responsibility to reveal Himself through us. But yet, sometimes we try and take that responsibility onto ourselves. Are we following? So as God said this, it's poignant as it was then, but it's as poignant as it is right now, as it was for Daniel. To every household and every school and to every parent, teacher and child upon whom shone the light of the gospel comes at this crisis the question put to Esther the Queen at that momentous crisis in Israel's history. Who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? Such a time as this is 2018. The question comes to you. But I want to try and give us a paradigm shift in how we see this, and in turn, the health message. Those who think of the result of hastening or hindering the gospel, think of it in relation to themselves and to the world. So let's just pause there. You know when we think of, we, we, we think, okay, right. If the gospel is hindered, what's going to happen to me? What's going to happen to the world if the gospel is hindered? We think, well, it's going to get worse and worse and worse. The world's going to wax work. We always see it in those two perspectives. Is it me? Or what will it do to the world? But God is seeking to change and bring a paradigm shift with that and bring it to this. Few think of its relation to God. Few give thought to the suffering that sin has caused our Creator. All heaven suffered in Christ's agony, but that suffering did not begin or end with His manifestation in humanity. So let's just pause there. We go back to when sin was found in the heart of Lucifer. And we see then that the pain of God started there. But from when it was found in the heart of Lucifer, did sin go up or did it go down? Question. It went up, it's increased. It's increasing, it's increasing, it's increasing. So with that, we can gauge that is the pain in God's heart increasing? 
all the time. The pain in God's heart is increasing day by day. So then, that same question that we always pose to the world and to us, we can pose and change it and say, what does this do, his hindering or hastening the gospel, do to the heart of God? If I hinder it, it means more pain for him. But if I hasten the gospel, it means relief for him. That brings a shift and it brings us in contact and into sympathy with the heart of God. And in that is a driver, an energizer of us going forward. It is an energizer of us living out this health message that God has given us. And this we cannot do of ourselves, but where do we see all this crystallized and simplified for us? The cross. If we look at the cross, we see this. The cross is a revelation to our dull senses of the pain that from its very inception, sin has brought to the heart of God. Every departure from the right, every deed of cruelty, Every failure of humanity to reach his ideal brings grief to him. The definition of grief is mental anguish. I can understand that myself even more with the loss of my grandmother. It's a pain that I can't describe. If you said, Marcus, describe your pain, I, I wouldn't be able to tell you. But it hurts. But well, imagine that God is going through that indescribable pain every day, and it gets worse. But you know, we see these things on here, we see them, we see them, think, okay, every departure from, from the right, yeah, um, I can see how that could hurt God. Every deed of cruelty, yeah, especially I can see how that would hurt God. But then, every failure of humanity to do what? Reach his ideal. Higher than the highest human thought is God's ideal for us. If you just take a moment to think of what God's ideal is for you, take a moment. It's way higher than that. But God is pained when we fall short of it. So to reach this higher ideal, which we can't even fathom, we need all the help we can get. You believe so? Most definitely. So with this, God is reaching down to us and giving us his help that we need. He's given it in his only begotten son, but something in so very practical for us too, by his grace and how we will bring this together for us. <laughs> First of all, to see how God is helping us, how wants us to reach this high ideal, we need to read um, this quote here, yeah? and understand his involvement with us. You see, the temptation for us is that, when you know when you see the picture of God molding Adam, you're just thinking of, you know, when you got everybody, everybody been to the beach and made a sandcastle of the room. And you just think, right, yep, pack the sand like that, that's it. No, God didn't make us like that. You can imagine him rolling out the veins and arteries. You can imagine him just molding the muscle to then pull them to the bone. It was a very specific and particular way that it was made. It was very intricate. We didn't need to be intricate, but God made us that way. Imagine making a skin and then putting a fold of skin on the outside, the intricacies of the eye with the rods at the back. Wonderfully and fearfully made, as God had done that. But then, the temptation for us again is to think that, hey, once we're made, once we're brought into this world, it's just has anybody had those cards that you draw back? I remember when I was little, you draw it back, draw it back, draw it back, and then you let it go and it goes boom, usually into the wall or into the side. You're like, wow, and then you do it again. We 
We're tempted to think that God's like that, it's like, right, I'll wind him up for about 70 years, give him about 70 years and just let him go. Ooh, off you go. Off you go, Marcus. But as we read this, we see the mechanism of the human body cannot be fully understood. It presents mysteries that baffle the most intelligent and it's still baffling people today. It is not as the result of the mechanism which once set in motion continues its work. That the pulse beats and the breath follows the breath. It's not part of it because of a mechanism. In God we live and move and have our being. The beating heart, the throbbing pulse, every nerve and muscle in the living organism is kept in order and activity by the power of an ever-present God. Just take two seconds to just feel your pulse. That's God doing that for you. Take a second to just breathe in and breathe out. That's God. An ever-present God that is doing that, you know when we just call here, yeah, just the post, this is the post. No, that's God saying, I'm with you, I love you, I love you. When I move and the blood needs to flow into the muscle, that's God just moving it there. When I look around, that's God moving my eyes. Everything is from Him, ever present God. If He wasn't present, then it would all stop. Wonderfully and, and fearfully made. To all calculations, and probably this is a the number, there's 37 trillion cells taking this theme of the ever present God. And if we say 37 trillion cells, and let's just say we know that it's not just doing one process, okay? Well, let's say each cell is doing at least one process, okay? If each cell is doing at least one process, how many times or how much thought from God does that take to do that? 37 trillion. And David saw this in, in Psalm 139 verse 14. Is that he said, I will praise thee for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvellous are thy works that my soul knoweth right well. How precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God. How great is the sum of them. Imagine if we were just looking at the cell processes, it would be 37 trillion. If I should count them, they are more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with thee. Praise God. He's thinking about you all the time in so many different ways. So as we look into this, um, as God is ever present in our lives, we must see the, the human body as we can see there. We need to overlay our bodies onto the sanctuary. Because Paul says to us in 1 Corinthians 6 19 when he said, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own, for ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So we home into that word, know you that, that your body is the temple. And another word for temple is the Sanctuary. Okay. So in that, if we delve a little deeper, we'll be able to bring lessons out of the sanctuary, okay, that will help us in reaching our high ideal. Amen. So let's see what we can draw out of the, the sanctuary that can help us by God's grace. Now the sanctuary So the sanctuary, as you can see, is made up of three very distinct parts, okay? 
We see part number one, which is the outer court. We see part number two, which is the holy place. And part number three, which is the holy of holies. Now, let's come back to the human, to humanity. Us as humans, do we have three uh, distinct paradigms or three different dimensions? Do we have three different dimensions? Yes, we do. We have the physical, we have the mental, and we also have the spiritual. So in that, we should be able to overlay that onto the sanctuary. So, if I was to distinguish and say, what is physicality? If I do this, can you see it? But well, if I'm thinking to do that, can you see it? No. So, something that represented that in the sanctuary is the outer court. It's something that could be seen by those coming into the sanctuary and those that are in the sanctuary. Amen? On this part. So, let's lay the outer court, let's put the physical there. Okay. So, here we go, we move into the holy place. Now, to give us a clue with regards to what the holy place represents, we need to look at this here. Going into the holy place, there is one, two, three, four, five posts. Okay. So with that being five posts, we can overlay that. What we what do we that has that's very important to us that we have five of the, the senses. And all those senses lead into the into the brain. We see that. So with that, we see that this is something, the holy place, which is representing the mental aspect of man. Okay, you see that? That's all senses are there. The mental aspect. So then, we then go into the next part, which is the holy of holies. Okay. But to give us a clue, we again, we just look into the furniture that was in that. Now we also know it as it's the Ark of the Covenant, but we know it as the mercy seat. And above that mercy seat was the Shekinah glory of God. So it was a representation of heaven and the throne of God. Now what do you do on a throne? Do you eat breakfast and dinner and lunch? Do you just sit there in silence? No, you don't. It's a very special place. And it's one where commands are given. We see that um, in, in, in the midst of, in Revelation 5, where we say there are angels 10,000 times, 10,000 and thousands and thousands. And as Christ and, and the Christ is giving out the instruction, they're going out as lightning to and from the earth. As God is giving instruction. Okay, see that? So with that. Very much of the spiritual aspect of man is regards to our decisions that we make. For our decisions, they make actions and actions, habits and habits form character. But then if we bring it down to the most reducible thing, it is the decisions that we make from day to day. Am I making a decision to be broken down? Or am I making a decision to be restored? Am I making a decision to live for God? Or am I making a decision to live for myself? Am I making a decision to be selfish? Or am I making a decision to be unselfish? All of these are deemed by the higher spiritual, mental, and also the, the physical. But what I want to draw our attention to is as we look at this, the, the whole sanctuary, and we move through it, the importance of the most holy place, and it will come into to practice now. We know with regards to the brain, 100 billion, an approximate, um, 100 billion euro, and it weighs 3 pounds, and it uses approximately 25% of the body's energy. Each nerve cell can record 86 million bits of information each day of our life. And his memory can hold a hundred trillion bits of information in a lifetime. Every second your brain forms at least a thousand different chemical reactions, which in turn create thoughts, emotions and actions, all done by an ever-present blood. It is said that if someone were to build a computer to match the capabilities of the human brain, the housing unit would have to be three times the size of the Empire State Building, it would need all the energy of Niagara Falls to power it, 
while it would take all the waters of Niagara to cool it, and it would utilize all the electronic circuitry of all the radio and television stations of the world. So let's see, three of all that to power it, all of Niagara Falls to power it, but then all of Niagara Falls to this cooling down. Well, as we go in the most holy place, we see the frontal lobe. It's something we would have heard before, but it's something that we can overlay in the sanctuary, we can see. And in the frontal lobe is where we see our judgment and also our reasoning powers, our ability to reason and also to judge. Scientific studies have also shown that the frontal lobe is the seat of spirituality, morality, and most important of them is the, the will, the ability to actually choose. One of the frontal lobe's most vital functions, as we said, is the will, and we can see that. And it differs as we look in the different animals of creation, let's say for instance a cat, which only has 3.5% frontal lobe, a dog has 7% of it is a frontal lobe, a monkey has 17%, but we have 33%. You see, I'm trying to connect the dots in this, uh, make the connections there. So seeing that judgment, reasoning, spirituality, morality and the will is housed here in the frontal lobe, how important is it? Is it the most holy? So as we see, we go from the physical, the mental and the spiritual, each are as important as themselves. Let's say, for instance, you look at the sanctuary service. I have to come with a lamb. Can I just come with any lamb to the sanctuary service? No. What was the instructions for that lamb? No blemish. That was told, with, why the lamb is say with no blemish? It was, if there was a blemish on the lamb, it means that the blood would be impure. Okay? And if the blood was impure, then it can't be in brought to the sanctuary. Can we see? So, with that, I'm bringing a lamb without blemish. So, therefore, I'm bringing a sacrifice with, that has good blood. And then that blood is transferred from the physical into the mental and therefore into the, the spiritual. If I have bad blood in this part here, then it falters on the other aspect. Have you seen that? So our cooperation with God is what is needed is that cooperation of good blood. Amen? Therefore, the physical, the mental, and the spiritual can continue in that work of restoration. God is asking us by His grace to use His methods to have good blood. But more importantly, as we said, in the, um, the most holy place, as we said, was the frontal lobe. But well, God is looking to speak to us. It says the brain nerves which communicate with the entire system are the only medium through which heaven can communicate to man and affect his inmost life. We need to be changed from the inside out, not the outside in. But for God to affect us in our inmost life, he needs to communicate with us. We follow him? He doesn't communicate with me through my hands, I put my hands in the air and just send some communication through that way. It's through the brain now. So if those who are affected, then effectively the communication is cut off to a degree. And therefore my inmost life cannot be affected. It's, it's, um, you see it in war. Use the example. In war, um, any army or general will tell you that effectively to make the, the armies that they're against disaffected, disunified, and going in different directions, they first need to take out the communication pulse. If they take out the communication pulse, then the army is in disarray. Satan is looking to do the same thing with us by affecting our blood. But praise God, he's given us these, these laws of help. And God asks us to hold his hand through these laws of health, that therefore give us good blood, which then help us to then return physically, 
mentally and spiritually. You know, we hear the fact, the fact that if my blood's affected, then how am I able to make good decisions? If I can't communicate, my communication is broken down with God, how am I supposed to walk with Him in communication? And therefore make the right decisions for eternity? So we need to, by His grace, to work with Him in cooperation with Him in these laws of health. Fast forward for, the, for that. So with this, we need to just bring what we've learned into end time, into this time that we live now. We need to see a revelation of God's character. We need to have God's character revealed through us. But if we go to Revelation 13, um, if we quickly go there, Revelation 13, and verses 3, um, and verses 16 and 17, Somebody else is looking to reveal themselves to. In Revelation 13, verse 3, it says, And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wandered after the beast. This talks of a time when church and state will come together to oppress God's people and to inflict a law and try to force the conscience of everybody around the world to have the mark of the beast. To force the conscience. But it says in verse 16, and he causes all both small and great, rich and poor, free and one, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell save he that had the mark before the name of the beast or the number of his name. Have you ever wondered why God would use the word beast? He could have used any other word. Well, we see that, that in Revelation 13 it was an amalgamation of different beasts. But God calls it the mark of the beast. But why does he call it the mark or the word of the beast? In the Bible, beast was often just used to describe an animal. Okay. Um, have you seen that? Um, and we're going to look at some um, different texts. But God called every different animal a beast to a degree. It's a beast. So from here, we will give us a little clue as we read this quote. They, beasts and animals, they cannot understand or acknowledge the sovereign, sovereignty of God. Yet they were made capable of loving and serving man. The psalmist says, Thou made us him to have dominion of the works of thy hands, that was put all things under his feet, the beasts of the field and the fowls of the air, and whatsoever passeth through the seas. So we see that animals in themselves, and or beasts, are not capable of loving God, or recognising the sovereign sovereignty of God, but they can recognise that in man. Okay. If we go to Psalm 73, um, verse 22, and it says, just for time's sake, it says, So foolish was I, and ignorant, I was as a beast before thee. Do you see that? So a beast would be to define somebody that is foolish and ignorant. Foolish and ignorant of what? 1 Corinthians 1.18 says, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. So the cross represents the power of God. But what is the power of God? In Numbers 14 verses 17 and 18, our Moses describes it to us and he says, And now I beseech thee, let the power of of my Lord be great, according as thou hast spoken, saying, The Lord is long suffering and of great mercy, and forgiving iniquity and transgression, and by no means clearing the guilty. So Moses makes the connection of the power of God being to according as he has spoken. God has spoken these things of his character, that is, his long suffering, great mercy, and forgiving iniquity. 
So putting this together is those that have received the mark of the beast are ignorant and foolish in regards to the character of God. Do we get that? So with that, is it any wonder that the devil is trying to take out the communication? To induce and to cloud the frontal lobe, to keep people, and sometimes even us, ignorant and foolish with regards to the character of God. If I can't see the character of God, then how am I supposed to reveal it? Because by beholding, I become, I become changed. And the world needs the full revelation of God, so therefore I need to see the full revelation of God. Are we following? But with this, God has, um, hasn't left us to do this on our own, as I said. He's given us by His grace these help laws which will help us to reveal His character, but also to see Him. You know, somebody who snorkels on the top of the sea with a snorkel, are they then able to go 100 meters down into the sea? No, they need certain equipment for them to be able to deep sea dive. We're deep sea diving into the character of God, but yet sometimes we're just equipping ourselves with a snorkel and wondering why we have to come back up to the top. But God has given us these health laws to enable us to deep sea dive into his character and see more of his love and a revelation of it. Because as it's revealed in us, it's then revealed to the world. Amen? And that's what the world needs. No wonder Daniel says, no, 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 I'm revealing the God of character of God here. I'm not going to defile myself. God's character needs to be revealed. But well, let's I'm go to a story which brings all this together. In Psalm 32, verse 9, God says to us, Be ye not as the horse, or as the mule, which have no understanding, whose mouth must be held in with bit and bridle, lest they come near unto thee. In the experience with horses, if you go up to a hill and it has a 40% gradient, you don't see the horse turning around and go, hmm. okay, this has a 40% gradient, I don't think we're gonna make it up here today. Let's turn around and go back. It has no understanding, it can't reason those things. Well, God is asking us not to be as the beasts or the mules which have no understanding, which have to be beaten to go to different ways. God is looking to instruct us in a very special way. In Daniel, if we go to Daniel 4, just as we're coming towards the close, Daniel 4. Daniel 4 is just giving us an example of, of this mark of the beast, but also the opposite of it, which is the, the seal of God. In Daniel 4, and verse 16, we see a scenario. Nebuchadnezzar, after being, after being warned by Daniel with regards to the selfishness in his heart, saying, look at this kingdom that I have made and is greater to my glory. After all, and Daniel 3, he still turned to himself. And as he did this, in verse 16 we see, he said, let his heart be changed from man's and let a beast's heart be given unto him. Let's pause there. So he goes from having the heart or the mind of a man to having that of a, a beast with no understanding, no reasoning, no intellectual power. But then in turn, what happens to Nebuchadnezzar as this happens to him? And we can see. We see, if we go to Daniel 4 verse 34, we see what happens to him. And it says, And at the end of days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up my eyes unto heaven, and my understanding did what? Returned unto me. And I blessed the Most High, and I praised and honoured him that liveth forever. So we're seeing that without understanding, Nebuchadnezzar was unable to praise God. Are we following? But it continues. 
So the understanding returned unto him, but what else came to him in verse 36? It says, at the same time, my reason returned unto me, and for the glory of my kingdom, my honour and brightness returned unto me. So at the same time that his understanding returned to him, his reason returned to him too. And therefore he is able to praise God by God's grace. Amen. So, you know what Daniel, what Nebuchadnezzar effectively had was a, a new start plan. As he was out in that wilderness, what helped his reason to be restored? What helped his understanding to be restored? He had hydrophobia as the water passed over him. He had those green, the green um, juices. He had the green which then was cleansing his body and regenerating his cells. But as all these things of the New Start plan worked with Nebuchadnezzar, at the end of that seven years, it was an intensive plan, or it was something that was needed. At the end of that seven years, he was able to do what? To praise God. To see his character clearly. And then he was returned to his throne. We're in need of a New Start plan by God's grace. The world is in need of a new start plan so that their reason and their understanding can return unto them and they can see the character of God that is revealed through all of you and through all of you here. Yeah? And to see this, this is something that Paul states to us and something that will be clear to us in that Paul states to us that I beseech you, therefore, it isn't so much of, hey, I'm just asking you, I'm begging you by the mercy of everyone, the mercy of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Now, at the time of this, this would have been a bit often people think, what's Paul talking about? Because sacrifices are dead, sacrifices die. But Paul is in turn asking us to be a living sacrifice, something that is both dead but yet alive. I am crucified with Christ, but nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Walking as dead, but having Christ living in us. Wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. In perspective of what Christ has done for us, how do these laws of health fall into just the reasonable service? And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The renewing of mind that took place for Nebuchadnezzar needs to take place in our hearts too. But to understand this process and what went on, I'll just leave us with an illustration. We hold into that word of transform, where we get the word metamorpho, where we get the word in turn metamorphosis. And it's something we always associate with the word metamorphosis. And it's this friend of the gardeners, a caterpillar. Any keen gardeners here throw some food or anything? Okay, no, but I had an experience of growing kale and come out to stalks of kale because of one of these guys. Well, lots of these guys. But if you was to sum it up, the mind of these caterpillars to a degree, it would be one of selfishness because do they care about you as they're eating away at your nice curly kale? They're just thinking about their existence and the energy that they need for them to give. So it's like it's take, 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 take. But in turn, there's a nice meal as it's eating. But in turn, it goes into this, the chrysalis. But in that chrysalis, the scientists we're seeking to find out what happens that it comes out as a butterfly. So as scientists do, they had micro cameras and put it into the chrysalis. I guess what happened? It turned into caterpillar soup, mush. It just turned to a liquid in that nothing. Spiritual lesson in that for us to change, to have this change of mind, we need to become as nothing. 
And as the moment becomes nothing, it is then reformed and changed into this, the beautiful butterfly. How does the mindset from caterpillar to butterfly change? Instead of one of selfishness of take, 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 it starts to reflect more of the character of God in that it takes to give. We're reflecting God's character as we take to give. Just as this, as it takes that nectar, it takes the pollen and it pollinates. So are we too with this change of mind that God wants us to have by His grace. But also, the mindset of, as I said, for a butterfly is it, you know when that wind blows on and that caterpillar is on that leaf, does it need to see the wind pockets in the air? No, it doesn't, because it's just on the leaf. But a butterfly needs to. When the wind is also soft, the antenna and the eyes actually distinguish pockets in the air. So that's why when you see butterflies, like, that's why the fly is a little bit funny. Sometimes as you're following God and people may see you like this in the things and how you live your life. But you're following God and to the normal eye you're peculiar. Because you're seeing the ways out of temptation that God is making for you. But that can only be seen with a renewed mind. So as we grasp this, this renewed mind, I pray it's only by the grace of God that we can enabled to follow these laws of health. You know, in just bringing it back to seeing God's heart, if I drink some water, what does that do to the heart of God? You just drunk some water, sir. He's smiling. Because you're cooperating with him in working towards that high ideal. Amen. If I go out for just a five minute walk, what does that do to the heart of God? It brings a smile to him in the midst of his pain. And it helps him to cooperate with you more by his grace. So all I want to by God's grace is to see how this health fits in with the whole plan of salvation. And for the God's plan of restoring us back to the original. And I will just ask us by His grace, my appeal is, is for us to, by His grace, start doing some of these things if we're not doing them already. Drinking more water, exercising, going out in the open air, looking at our nutrition, abstaining from that which is bad and being moderate in that which is good for us. Because as we do this, not only does it bring in a smile to God's heart, but it helps us to make better decisions, which in turn help us to be restored back to the original. Not just physically, not just, not just mentally, but spiritually too. Where is where is. And if this if is your, um, your wish too, I'll just ask you to, to stand. Let's just say a word of prayer um, for this. Where is where is.